Good morning, church. Uh, if you have your Bibles, uh, please open it to Genesis chapter 26. Um, I'd say last night I was going through my sermon and I was preparing and uh, praying about it, all these things, and I, I saw something in there. I was like, man, I should have seen that in the two weeks I've spent preparing this. And then I was like, oh, shoot. So I was a little anxious. And then, you know, hearing the news of this morning, it, this, it sort of, again, brings that sort of weight to us coming and looking at the Word of God and seeing what God has for us. And so let's open in a word of prayer. Let's pray that God is speaking in this time. God, we, we come before you with heavy hearts. And we mourn with those who are mourning right now. This is the season that um, we're in as a church community. And I pray that your word would be heard here and that it would bring strength to us in the time that you have us in. God, we pray that this time draws us nearer to you, that we would fall in love more with you through understanding your word. And we pray these things in your son's name. Amen. Um, as many of you know, we've gone through Romans for several months here. And um, I'd say as a preacher, it's kind of fun to go through prose because one of the things in a prose discourse or like letters is that the author says something and then it just tells you what you need to say as a preacher. It's like, I'm just going to say what he says again in like modern updated terms. And so there's, there's some sort of like ease to that, um, that when we get to biblical narrative isn't there. <laughs> um, because a lot of times with biblical narratives, one of the things we learn about biblical narratives is it doesn't tell you in most cases what's right and what's wrong. It just tells you a story and then you're supposed to know. And that makes it difficult because then we have to, like, analyze, okay, what is it doing? And why it's doing this is, is because in many cases, it's holding a mirror up to us. It's having us evaluate our own lives and see if, like, this is talking about us. And it helps draw you into the narrative in a way that things don't, like, when I tell you a true statement, that's different than if I tell you a story to communicate that same message. And it draws us in in a certain way, and it, it brings us in in a different way. And so I'm actually really excited to preach narrative. And what I'm going to do today is I want to bring us along uh, in the narrative. So I'm actually going to read a, probably the entire ch chapter today um, because I want you to see the beauty of this narrative. But one thing I want to comment on because of the culture we live in is that uh, narrative is different again, than prose discourse, than letters, than that sort of writing. And it's different in the way where um, in, in our culture, this is what I mean to say, it's different in our culture than it was in ancient cultures too. I think nowhere is this more clear uh, in, uh, than in our art. I don't know if you guys have looked at modern art recently, um, but we, uh, as a culture, have adopted what's called abstract art. And have you ever looked at abstract art? I have one example for you right here. This is what this is for. Um, what is this? <laughs> and I, I love, it's nice. That's, this isn't like a criticism. But the question is, what is this? And exactly, we don't know. And that, that's kind of the thing that I wanted to point out, is in our modern art, what's, what's it telling you? I don't know. Um, and that's kind of the point, because in our modern culture, what we've done is we've said it's not the author who gives something meaning, it's how does whatever you're looking at make you feel? And so each individual has their own interpretation of a piece of art, and how does it make you feel is the true meaning of art. But if you actually go back in history, artists had an intent in the story they were telling you. Any good piece of art tells you a story and draws you in, I would argue. And it's not just like, oh, what do you feel about it? It's like the artist is communicating something to you. 
There's an intent in the story being structured the way it is, in, in the pictures, in the images, in the things that it's drawing in, that in our modern art, we kind of like don't do in the same way sometimes. But any Renaissance painting will absolutely do this. And it helps you understand how they approach the world, how they saw things, how they prioritize things. And so as we read biblical narrative, what we need to see is that the biblical narrative is, is there to shape the way you view the world. You're supposed to see things the way that the biblical authors saw the world. And so my hope today is that we, as we look at this, we begin to evaluate our own preconceived notions about how things go and begin to see things the way that the author intended to. And the reason I give that sort of preamble is as we look at this text, um, this is a story about Isaac. I don't know if you saw, the story immediately goes to Isaac. But if you were here last week, you, you heard that last week's story was about Jacob and Esau being born. And why all of a sudden are we back in time? This is not chronological. Why have we shifted order? Why have we gone out of order and all of a sudden are looking at the story of Isaac? This seems like a weird interlude. And I'm going to tell you, Genesis does this multiple times. It'll just like, uh, if we, when we get to the story of Joseph in the future, it's going to start the story of Joseph. It's going to tell you about his Technicolor dream coat. And then it's going to tell you a story about Judah for some reason. And then back to Joseph. It's like, why are you doing that? Well, I would argue the author has a purpose. The author has a purpose. And what I think the purpose is today, and this is kind of my big idea, what I, I want us to get from this, or what I think the author is trying to communicate, is that you are not your father. You are not your father. And if father isn't the right word for you in there, it's you're not your parent, or you are not anyone else, but in this narrative, it's Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and so it's father, son, son, right? Like, that's why I framed it that way. But whatever you need to put in there, you are not your father. And so I, what I want us to do is I want us to look at the text together. We're going to pick up in verse 1, and we're going to read along. And I want to point some things as we go along the way. If you remember, though, um, just to give some, uh, some background before we start, is in the story of Abraham, Abraham, God came to him and began to speak with him. And the first thing God tells him to do is leave his land, leave your family behind, and go to the land I am calling you. And then he goes to the land, and immediately there's a famine. And so he's left with this question of, how are you going to respond in the famine? And how does he respond? Well, he goes to Egypt, a place he shouldn't be in. And then he, in Egypt, he uh, kind of gives up his wife to Pharaoh because he's scared. And so that's the story of Abraham. Now we're looking at the story of Isaac. And what I want you to see is how similar this story is. Pick up in verse 1. Now, there was a famine in the land. Besides the other famine, the one that I was just talking about, that was in the days of Abraham. Isaac went to Gerar to Abimelech, king of the Philistines. So he, again during the time of famine, is living under a foreign king. And the Lord appeared to him. He said, don't go to Egypt. Don't do what your father did. Don't go to Egypt. Dwell, of the, uh, dwell in the land of which I shall tell you. Sojourn in this land. Say here, I will be with you and I will bless you. For to you and your offspring I will give all of these lands. And I will establish an oath. That I swore to Abraham your father, I will multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven, and I will give your offspring all these lands. And I want you to circle, underline, highlight, whatever you do to your Bible on this next sentence here. And in your offspring, all of the nations of the earth shall be blessed, because Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge and my commandments and my statutes and my laws. I think one of the key things to unlocking what uh, the author is trying to communicate is right there at the beginning. What does God say to him? He said, in you and in your offspring, all of the nations of the earth will be blessed. So Isaac is faced with a similar problem that his dad had. And he has a famine. He's in a foreign land. 
how is he going to respond? That's the question we enter into chapter six, or I'm sorry, verse 6 with. It says, so Isaac settled in Gerar. Is that what God called him to do? Absolutely. Great job, Isaac. You did what you were supposed to do. Let's see how long this lasts. When the man of the place asked him about this, about his wife, he said, uh, she's my sister. Okay, so that lasted not very long. She's my sister, which is exactly what his dad did when faced with a similar question. Because he feared to say, my wife, thinking lest the men of the place should kill me because of Rebecca, because she was attractive in appearance. I want you to also highlight that word again, circle attractive in appearance. That's an important thing. Um, anytime you're reading the Bible, if something like that shows up, that's an important note for you. Isaac has just been put to the test. And the way that Rebecca is described is attractive in appearance. Or in the Hebrew, the d- literal translation is good of sight, which is exactly how um, Abraham's wife Sarah was described, which also, by the way, is exactly how the fruit of the garden, the tree of the knowing good and evil, was described. And so what you're being told is Isaac was given this opportunity. And he's like, well, she looks good, so I'm going to do what I want. So we know that from that, Isaac has abandoned what he has been called to do. He's abandoned what he's been called to do. And so when he had been there a long time, verse 8, Abimelech, king of the Philistines, looked out of window and saw Isaac laughing with Rebekah, his wife. So Abimelech called to Isaac and said, Behold, she is your wife. How could you say she is my sister? He gets caught in the lie just like his father got caught in the lie. We're replaying the same problems over and over and over again. He is sinning just like Eve. He is sinning just like Abraham. He is sinning just like Noah. He is sinning like all the people before him. What is God going to do when faced with an unfaithful partner again and again and again? That's the question that I think is being asked here. But let's finish this part of the story. So Abimelech called out to Isaac. I'm sorry. Um, Isaac said to him, because I thought, lest I die because of her, Abimelech said, what is this you have done to us? One of us might have easily lain with your wife, and you would have brought guilt upon us all. Isaac, you would have brought guilt upon us all. And what I want to draw here is, I want to draw a contrast between what Abimelech just said to Isaac and what God had said to him. God said, you're going to go to this land and I'm going to bless you and you're going to be a light to all the nations. Isaac goes and he chooses to abandon the way he was supposed to approach things. He lies and he deceives and he gets caught in his deception. And what does Abimelech, this foreign pagan king, say to him? You would have brought a curse on us. And I want to ask you this question that I think the text is asking us today. God has put you in a place. God has brought you where you are. And are you going to be a blessing or a curse to those around you? God, put us in the place that we are. He has has put you in the job you are in. He has put you in the role you are in in order that you may be a blessing to all those around you. But the decisions you make can make you a curse to those around you. And so the question I think being asked here is like, man, How is God going to redeem this situation? What is he going to do? Why are the pagans the ones that are telling the faithful people how they should be acting? That's not how this should be going. What should be happening is Isaac should be bringing light to other people, but instead the king is bringing light to him? And as we're we're holding a mirror up to ourselves, what are the ways where we should be being a light to our community? 
and we are choosing to go our own way. We're choosing to be selfish. We're tru- choosing to do things in our own lives where we're bringing curses upon people because of the way we're acting, because of the way we're treating them. I mean, sometimes we don't, we don't think about it, right? Like, we think that when we act, it's just, oh, it's just a small little lie, right? It's not that big a deal. It's not really going to affect anybody. But it really does. How you act fundamentally affects. I, I want to give an example um, because it's a small example, and it, it's just... It, just to illustrate the point, when I worked at Starbucks, I worked there for about six and a half years. And when we worked there, um, I worked at like 30 different stores and different people were different. And one of the things they would ask us to do is like every night you need to be out by X time, right? Like 9, 9.30, whatever it is, okay? And so what the managers would say is like, okay, you clock out at 9.30, that's when you're done with work. Well, some people would... Uh, not be able to get all their work done in time. And so they would just clock out and finish. And that doesn't seem like a big deal, right? But it is a big deal. It's illegal, first and foremost. And second and second most, it's like, ah, it's not a big deal. But what happens the next day when somebody tries to clock out at 930 and not everything's done? Well, the manager looks at them like, why are you doing something wrong? And what it, be- what it begins is this, this sort of cycle where people feel like they have to be deceptive in order to keep things going. And it causes problems all throughout the, um, the company because people are working off the clock now. People are, are, the company is getting away with abusing their employees. Why? Oh, because you thought, oh, it's fine. I'm just going to do it. And it's like, we don't realize sometimes the impacts that are small little decisions that seem like minute. It seems like I might even be doing something good and how they affect other people. I think about another example from Starbucks is at the end of the night, I don't know if you guys know this, um, they throw away all their, their pastries, which is heartbreaking. <laughs> um, and when I was first working at Starbucks, what they would let us do is they would let us, like, at the end of the night, if it's going to go in the trash, you could just eat it, right? Like, it's fine. But what people started to do is they're like, oh, I'll just hide this so nobody buys it so I can have it at the end of the night. And it doesn't seem like a big deal, right? Because it's going to get thrown away anyway, right? Like, but Starbucks implemented a policy now, at least when I was there. I don't know anymore. It's been like 10 years. But they implemented a policy where it's like it either has to get donated or thrown in the trash, employees aren't allowed to eat the food. It's like, well, now all this food that some people need in order to live is just getting thrown in the trash. Why? Well, it's because you thought you could just sneak around and do this little thing, right? And we don't realize that in many of our little decisions that we make in our lives where we, we just fudge it a little bit, what we're doing is we're actually putting other people in a bad position. Our sinfulness doesn't just affect us. And so Isaac here in this text, what he decides is like, ooh, I don't want there to be this problem. Uh, So I'm just going to say she's my sister so we we don't run into any issues. And then we'll we'll leave eventually, right? It's going to be fine. It's not a big deal. But the reality is, it is a big deal. Because even the pagans are like, adultery is unacceptable. We can't do that. Which, again... It shocks me that the pagans need to tell the, the believers, hey, that's, that's immoral. That's wrong. Why are they needing to tell Isaac what is true and right? I, I would ask us that same question. Are there places where there are things in our culture where we've decided it's not a big deal And we begin to fudge on the principal convictions of Christianity. And the world's like, what are you doing? I think it's important that we as Christians listen to the criticisms being leveled against the church. Because sometimes, sometimes, they're letting us into insights where it's like we should be knowing better than what we're doing. And I don't know if you've seen the church in the news lately. But there are some things that the church needs to change. At least the church in America as a whole. And so the question that I think we should look at first and foremost 
is are we being a blessing or are we being the curse to those around us? And in the beginning of this narrative, Isaac is being a curse. He is bringing guilt and shame on these people because he chose to fudge instead of do what he was supposed to do. Live in conviction and do what he was supposed to do. I think Isaac's fear and his sinfulness causes him not just to sin, but put other people in a bad place. And I think we need to be aware that we may do that sometimes too. And we may do that with our kids. We may do that with our parents. We may do that with our families. We do it with anybody close to us. So evaluate. Pay attention. Because your sin isn't just your sin. It's something that affects all people. Everybody around you. But let's keep reading. We're in verse 12. It says, And Isaac sowed in that land and reaped in the same year a hundredfold. The Lord blessed him. Now, um, I read many commentators on this, and it, it surprises me how many of them see Isaac listened to God, and therefore he was blessed. And it's like the prior sentence was him lying about his wife and getting caught in his lie and being a curse to the people. I don't think, I don't think what this is saying is that Isaac is getting a blessing for his faithfulness. I think that's a weird way to read that sentence because, again, the prior sentence was he did evil stuff. So we come into verse 12, and I think God decided I'm going to work with this person despite his evil. We see the unfaithfulness of Isaac, and we see that God is like, I- I'm going to just work with you anyway. I'm going to continue to be faithful to you even when you don't deserve it. Even when you're being a curse to those, I'm just going to still be faithful to you. And praise God that we serve a God who wants to continue to work with us even at our worst. Praise God that even when we fail, God's like, I'm not giving up. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep working. I'm going to keep doing this. Isaac becomes great and wealthy. It goes on to say, look in verse 13. And the, the man became rich and gained more and more until he became very wealthy. Um, I want to pause here and, and talk about the Hebrew. The Hebrew doesn't just mean he became financially wealthy. And I also would think, again, that's a weird comment to just make if he was becoming financially wealthy. Because if it was just financially wealthy, didn't he inherit all the stuff he got from Abraham, who was incredibly wealthy? So uh, the Hebrew seems to imply that it can be he grew more and more into the person he was supposed to be. And so this could include financial blessings. God continued to work in him and bless him and help him grow. But I don't think it was just that. I think he became wealthy financially, but also he grew into the person he needs to, needed to be. And God began to work in his life despite Isaac's unfaithfulness. And we see a shift in the character of Isaac after this. Verse 14. He had possessions of flocks and herds and many servants so that the Philistines envied him. God continued to work with him so that the Philistines envied him. Now the Philistines had stopped and filled with earth all the wells that his father's servants had dug in the days of Abraham his father. And Abimelech said to Isaac, go away from us, for you are much mightier than us. We see that God is blessing you, so you need to leave. You have too much. So yes, he was financially wealthy, but I don't think that's all that is being said here. I think he is seeing God's favor on Isaac, and he's like, okay, you need to go. So Isaac departed from there and encamped in the valley of Gerar and settled there. And Isaac dug again the wells of water that had been dug in the days of Abraham, his father. Isaac leaves the place that God had told him to stay in and then goes. He's like, I'll just go and dig up my father's wells. That'll be good, right? And he gave them the name that, the father, that his father had given him. But Isaac's servants dug in the valley and found that there was a well of spring water. The herdsmen of Gerar quarreled with Isaac's herdsmen, saying, this water is ours. So he called in the name of the well Esek, because they contended with him. Then they dug another well and quarreled over that also. So he called his name Sitna. And he moved there and dug another well, and they did not quarrel over it. 
So he called his name Rehoboth, saying, For now the Lord has made room for us, and we shall be fruitful in the land. He moves and tries to do what his father did. He goes to where he knows. He goes to the places his dad dug wells. And he invests in the places that his dad dug wells. And what was he met with every step of the way? Quarreling. And then he moves to a new place. He digs a new well. And what does he say? There was no quarreling. And he's called his name Rehoboth, saying, For now the Lord has made room for us, and we shall be fruitful in the land. What I think we're being told in this story is that you are not your father. As I mentioned before, I think this is, this is the point here. Isaac is not Abraham. So Isaac's calling was not to just go to where Abraham did and dig Abraham's wells. God had a place for Isaac to thrive, and it wasn't just in the place that his father did. Because Isaac is not Abraham. And I think this gets into the major point of the entire passage because why is this narrative here? Why did we all of a sudden go from Jacob and Esau back to Isaac? Because the question is, how did God's favor get from Abraham to Isaac to Jacob? <clears throat> why did that happen? How did we get here? And I think what he's saying is, Isaac had to be faithful to God on his own. Isaac needed to go where God called him to go, be in the land that God called him to be, and God will make space for him there where he can do what God called him to do. And I worry that maybe for us, and, and, and maybe this is just my experience, but how many of us think the faithfulness of our parents in raising us in the way they should have is enough for us to be called children of God. Did the promise come to you just because of the faithfulness of God or is it because you trusted in God as well? It's easy for us to say, well, I was raised in a Christian home. I, I've been in a Christian environment. I went to Christian school. I've gone to church regularly. But does that make you a Christian? And the answer is absolutely not. It is not these external things. It's not the culture you grew up in that makes you a Christian. It's that you have a relationship with God, that you are trusting God in the way that you need to trust God. And what we're seeing here with Isaac is that Isaac is trusting God and moving to where God has him going. He can't just rely on doing what Abraham did because that's not what God called him to do. He needed to be in Beersheba. He needed to be in the place that God had called him to. Let me find my spot real quick. God moved him to a new land, and Isaac says, God has made space for me. Isaac moves to a new land, and he can begin to live into the purpose that God has called him to live in. Look what he says. He says, God said, or now that I'm in this land, I can be fruitful and multiply. Which, by the way, is exactly what humans were called to do in the beginning. In Genesis chapter 1, we were told that we need to be fruitful and multiply. So now that he is where God wants him to be, he can be fruitful and multiply. He's going to do what he was called to do. He can live into the promises that God <clears throat> called him to live in. And how many of us are trying to live into the promises that God has for somebody else Instead of doing what God called us to do. God doesn't call you to be. He doesn't call you to be the worker that somebody else is. He doesn't call me to be the pastor that some famous pastor is. He called me to be the faithful pastor that I need to be in this local community. It's easy for someone like me to like strive like, oh, I need to do X, Y, Z. But that's not what God has called me to do. He's called me to be faithful here. And in the same way, in your job. You're not called to be the CEO. You're not called to be Elon Musk in your community. You're called to be faithful in the, in the job that God has called you to be in. At home, your, your, your goal is to, 
to raise your children in the way they should go. It's not to be this perfect saint. It's just to be the parent that God called you to be. And it's so easy. I know maybe not everybody in this room uses Instagram and sees all the, the, the things that go on those reels. But it's like it's easy for us to look and see the pictures that people show of themselves and think, why am I not as good a parent as them? Why am I not as good a worker as them? Why am I not hustling the way they do? And it's like maybe that's not what God has for you. Don't look at what God has for other people and think that's what God has for you. God has your own well to dig. He has your own space to be in. So be there and live there and dwell in what God has for you, not in what God has for other people. And with Isaac, he needed to be, or he, he was facing strife every time he tried to just do what his father did. But when he moved to the new land, when he moved to the new space, God made space for him. The first example I gave was of our jobs. And I, I, I want to say that, that it's absolutely true. But it may be not just a physical thing. The question is, are you in the place with God that you need to be? See, in the Old Testament, they had a temple. And the temple was a physical, literal place for the people to go and be. But now God dwells in us. He, he dwells in his people. And so I don't think that the only way that this should be understood is just to say that there's a, a physical place that you need to live. And when you're living in the right place, that's, that's where all things happen. I think it also is, are you in right relationship with God? Is your walk with God where it needs to be? So we have this first, the physical, like, yes, are you listening to God and doing the work that God has called you to? Are you acting in those ways? But also, I want to say in the spiritual sense, are you following God the way you were called to follow God? I know for me, uh, as someone who listens to other preachers and hearing them, how they faithfully follow God, like, oh yeah, I spend like six and a half hours every morning praying. It's like, (laughs) I'm sorry, I can't do that. (laughs) I mean, maybe I could. Maybe I'm not waking up early enough, but (laughs) it's easy for someone like me to hear those things and think, man, maybe I'm not good enough. Maybe I'm not a good enough Christian, but my job is not to be that person that they are. God has worked in them that way. God has told me, though, to make space in my life to pray to him, to follow him the way that he has wired me to. Maybe I experience God in the listening to God's word rather than the sitting with an open Bible and highlighting God's word. Maybe, maybe that's the same for you. Maybe you need to discuss God's word in a community where you can interact with people and wrestle with these things. Maybe that's how God speaks to you. Maybe it's listening to more preaching. Maybe it's listening to more pot. Like God can speak to you in so many ways. And the question is, how are you going to hear the voice of God? How are you going to live into being the person that God has called you to be? And this isn't a one-size-fits-all thing. And I think that's that's really what I want to get at when I'm saying you are not your father. It's like your faith needs to be your faith. Your relationship with God needs to be your relationship with God. It cannot be somebody else's. You can get tips and tricks from other people, but you can't just say like, oh, yeah, I'm going to be like them. That's not what God wants for you. He wants you to find the way to connect with him that works for you. However, I do want to side note and say that it's not an excuse for you to not read the Bible and not be in his word. Just because they're like, oh, I think reading's boring. It's like, well, he's speaking to you. If you're choosing not to listen, if that's boring to you, you still need to read or listen or interact with God's word, Right? That, that still needs to be a regular part of your diet. But for everybody, it's going to be different. For everybody, it's going to be different. As we finish off this story, verse 23, 
It says, from there he went up to Beersheba, and the Lord appeared to him the same night and said, I am the God of Abraham your father. Fear not, for I am with you, and I will bless you and multiply your offspring for my servant Abraham's sake. So he built an altar there, and he called upon the name of the Lord and pitched his tent there. And there Isaac's servants dug a well. And to bring this back full circle, it says, when Abimelech went to him from Gerar with Ahuzath, his advisor, and Phicol, his commander of his army, Isaac said to them, why have you come to me, seeing that you hate me, and seeing that you have sent me away from you? And they said, we see plainly that the Lord has been with you. So we said, let there be a sworn pact between us, between you and us, and let us make a covenant with you, that you will do us no harm, just as we have not touched you and we have not done anything but good and have sent you away in peace. You are now blessed of the Lord, so that he made them a feast. And they ate and drank, and in the morning they rose early and exchanged oaths, and Isaac sent them on their way and departed from him in peace. That same day, Isaac's servants came and told him about the well that they had dug and said, We have found water. And he called it Shiva. And therefore, the name of the city is Beersheba, even to this day. I want to call this back to what I told us to highlight in verse 4. It said, And in your offspring, God comes to Isaac and says, And in your offspring, all of the nations of the earth will be blessed. And I think the key thing that we're supposed to see as as this comes full circle is that Isaac chose to do evil and God continued to work with him. Praise God for his faithfulness. And God continued to bless him. But as Isaac began to grow, yes, in material wealth, but also in spiritual wealth, as he began to grow as a believer and began to trust in God in the way that he acted... What do the other nations come to do? They come back to him. Say, we see God in you. And so for those of us who are struggling and saying, man, I don't know if I can trust God. I don't know if I can live into the promise that God has for us. It's like, that's what we were called to do. That's why we are here on this earth. God has you here at this point in time for a reason. God put you here. I, lo- I love it the way we, we listened to a pastor um, speak at a conference. He said, God's plan A, God's game plan for this time and this season is you. There's nobody else that's going to come and bailing us out as Christians. What God wants for the world today is the Christians that are here today to spread his word. God has brought you along for this time. He didn't bring your father here. And I also want to point out, he didn't bring your children into your life in the sense that they aren't living your life. Yes, you're supposed to raise them up and and send them off and, and teach them the way of God, but they're not supposed to live your life. You can't live through your children. They don't get a replacement for where God has you. God has you here. God has you in your job. He has you in your field. He has you in your career. And so if we try to live vicariously through our children, we are missing what God has for us and our ministry. But also if we're trying to be our parents, we're missing something as well because we are not our parents. The blessing came to Isaac because God had a plan for Isaac and he wanted He wanted Abimelech to see who God was through Isaac's work. And then God's going to have a similar plan for your children too. So don't try to live through your children. You are not your children, and they are not you. God has you here right now in your field, in your community for a purpose. So live into whatever that may look like for you. And it's going to look different for each one of us. But fundamentally, what we must know is that God has a specific plan, a specific purpose for where you are. And so you need to be living into that plan that God has for you, not the plan that God has for somebody else. And then we also need to spiritually pursue God in a way that is different than maybe some of the other people we see. We need to know God 
in a way that nobody else knows God. Isaac's wells are not Abraham's wells. Abraham's wells are not Isaac's wells. Jacob's wells are going to be different than Isaac's wells. What God has called you to is going to be different than other people. God puts you here for a purpose. You are here to be fruitful in your community. As we saw Isaac say, now that I'm where God wants me to be, I'm going to be fruitful. You are here to be fruitful and multiply in your community. For some of us, that's going to mean having kids. For some of us, it's going to be adopting kids. For some of us, it's going to be sheltering kids. Some of us, it's just going to be supporting other families who have kids. For some of us, being fruitful and multiply means spreading the gospel in foreign countries. For some of us, being fruitful and multiplying is going to be giving to the cause of missions and the church. For some of us, that's going to be on the street witnessing to people in your community. It's going to look different for each one of us. And some of us might be called to many of those things I just listed. And some of us will be called to other ones. And so the question is, are you going to live into the purpose that God has for you? Are you where God wants you to be? As soon as Isaac gets to the place that God made for him, God promises to be there with him and bless him and make him fruitful. And so Isaac stayed there. And so for all of Isaac's fault, eventually he did trust in God and he did live where God called him to. And so I think this story is is asking us that same question. Are you where God has you? Or are you where God wants you to be, I should say? Are you doing what God called you to do? Who did God make you to be? We're supposed to be lights in our community. Which, just side note, is why it makes no sense for us to leave areas that are pagan. If we're supposed to be the light, if we're like, oh, my, my employer is such a sinner, why would you leave? Who else is going to give him the light? If your state is dark, Who else is going to be the light? This is why God has you here. So what we need to do is build where we are. We need to plant where we are. We need to invest. We need to thrive where God has us. And we need to do this by loving one another. We need to pour into one another. We need to care about one another. We need to build each other up. We need to walk alongside one another and do, go on this journey together. And when we fail, we surround ourselves with the community and we seek after God and we pray and we intercede for one another. And we turn to Christ's body and his blood and remember that he, Christ died for us so that we could be made right with him. And we get back and we invest again. We start over again, and we continue to walk the path that God has, has us on. And so that's what we're going to transition to right now. I want us to reflect in our own heart, in our own mind, the places where we have fallen short, the places where we have not lived where God has called us to live. I want us to take a moment. How are we failing? Are we trying to live vicariously through our kids? Or we're trying to walk the path of somebody else instead of the one that God has for us. What ways are we doing that? And as you reflect on that, if you need to pray, we'll have people up here with you who can pray with you and come alongside you in this time. And if you feel guilt and shame, turn your eyes to Christ. And this is why every week we come to the bread and the cup is we remember our, the places we fail and we turn to Christ. And we remember what he did for us. And so we eat his, eat his body and drink his blood in the bread and in the wine. 
and we remember what Christ did for us on the cross. And finally, if you're looking for a way to begin to invest, one way you can do that is through giving to the church, giving to the work of God. Whatever that looks like for you, take a moment in this time to reflect, pray, and join us in the table with the bread and the cup.